to a very special live interview edition of Active Voices. Extremely, extremely wonderful episode today. Very honored, very lucky to be sitting down to talk about the upcoming documentary, Cliff Claremont's X-Men, that will be available on VOD on February 6th. And very fortunate to be sitting down with both the director and subject of the film. It's my great honor to welcome two active voices today, uh, director Patrick Meany and writer, creative, and comic legend Chris Claremont. Chris, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? Doing well. Thank you so much for sitting down with Active Voices and Age of the Nerd. Pleasure is mine. Just uh, as we get started, uh, just have to say, watch the film. Fascinating interior look into the whole process of how the X-Men came to life. So many wonderful interviews, of course, including yourself, but also other figures who were pivotal in the uh, creation of the uh, of the book and the production of the book during those, shall we say, glory years of the late 70s and early 80s. Um, just have to ask, what's it like looking back some 40 years past now at the success of what arguably is the most successful mainstream team comic book of all time? What was that like? Uh, pick an adjective, it probably applies. And too. <laughs> well, I think it, it what comes out in the uh, in the documentary was how much a, it was a labor of love uh, from uh, you know Len Wein's creation to your collaboration with your uh, various uh, uh, co-writers and, and uh, uh, artists mm-hmm. like Dave Cockrum, John Byrne, uh, Paul mm-hmm. Smith. Um, on and on, uh, John Romita Jr. Just su- such a such a, st- uh, a great lineup, a sterling cast of collaborators. Most interestingly was the uh, the interplay between yourself uh, and Louise Simonson, or actually she she was Louise Jones <laughs> back in those days, at least at the at a certain part of it. And Anne Nascenti. Um What was it about the collaboration on the book that? got you into the process? What what what, what was that like, having a, it's so many different collaborators over such a long period of time for a comic writer? Well, think about it, though. For the first 10 years, it was just me and Dave Cockrum and John Byrne and Paul Smith. That was it. Mm. Dave drew it for the first chunk of issues, then John, then Dave came back, and then Smitty. So the X-Men was a remarkably stable creative franchise uh, in terms of visual presentation and at the same time the the two artists involved John Byrne and, and Dave Cockrum were fundamental in in defining the characters and evolving them to through their young their young lives and from my perspective, I had the, in, in the un, unbeatable good fortune of getting a franchise title when it had just been created. I mean, the previous, we, we were, the previous arc of X-Men had basically come to an end. This was a whole new bunch of characters. The only holdovers were Cyclops, Professor X, and the concept of the school, and then Gene. A uh, couple of issues later. So this was virgin territory. So, in, and in reality, that that was a a, a a a wonderful gift that no other concept at Marvel at that time, and no other writer had the opportunity, or DC for that matter, had the opportunity to to secure. Um, everything else had been around for ten years: the FF, the Avengers. Or the X Men was brand new, and that that was just absolutely wonderful. And unfortunately, will never likely never happen again. Well, some of the conditions don't exist anymore. Um, I can remember when the book was not 
even a monthly book. <laughs> when it was, so can I. Yeah, it was when it was something that was not the established force that it, it, it is today and that it became over the course of the next uh, 15 years, but when it was something kind of new and experimental and it was kind of like, let's see what works here. <laughs> let's see what we're gonna what happens. Let let's let's play with these concepts and see where these characters go. And uh, I think that's uh, an aspect. And I'm curious on your take on this is is um, is that something that's maybe missing somewhat from our mainstream comic industry today? Uh, just the ability to just kind of get in there and play with a concept. Well, I think everyone's too aware of of, of the ultimate impact. Uh, the, every, companies want to play things safe. Creators want to to be wildly, excitingly creative with material that they have absolute control over, their own property. Not, not. No one wants to to spend 20 years of their lives making money for a corporation, uh, which might wake up one morning and decide, well, we we rather have. Person A rather than person B do this this concept. You don't mind, do you? So um, the, the 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 bedrock of structure of the creative relationships have changed over the course of decades, and that's again that's something that that the companies and the creators have to deal with. But you know that's to part to pardon the heist of Robert of uh, the old TV phrase. That's the way it is. You yeah. know, you gotta, you have to deal with it. You know, uh, that that also brings another interesting aspect of how the book developed uh, to mind, and something that I was struck when I listened uh, to and watched the film and listened to you talk about your own uh, personal biography and uh, kind of the. Uh, the aspect of your childhood being the uh, son of a, a military uh, officer and kind of moving from place to place quite a, quite a few times during your youth, I was interested to, to wonder, do you think that had an impact on the writing of things like X-Men? Because you are, as a, as a creative, you are always noted for your ability to handle character and dialogue and motivation and it always struck me that you always had a good grasp of what uh, people uh, say and perhaps even the disconnect between what they say and what they do. Uh, and yet, you know, your characters always seem I, to have I, very I rich inner lives. I've argument from a lot of editors I work for. That's a whole different <laughs> discussion. I would say yes. I mean, every, every writer's past goes into the, the work that they produce, the stories they tell, the way they choose to tell them. Every writer's ability to observe the world around them, that's that's our stock and trade. So, uh, obviously, the, the stories, the characters reflect that. Um, that is the, I guess the difference is that, that sadly, being company characters they of necessity become far more mutable in the hands of different creators, visual and textual, than, than, you know, Harry Potter will always be Harry Potter because J.K. Rowling will always have her eye on him and define him no matter who plays with that universe, if, if, even if other people were allowed to play with that universe. Um, Spider-Man... Not so much. He 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 is. A, there's a basic rule of who this is. Who Peter Parker is. But within that, every writer brings a different perspective, a different aspect, a different sense of story realities that they want they want to portray. And one writer's stories may invalidate what another writer has done or turn it in a different direction. Uh, but that's that's that simply is the way it works. The the, the way our market works. Well, and, and well, I, I will certainly say that uh, I think you still have the market cornered on uh, who some of these characters are, including stor characters like Wolverine, Storm, uh, Magneto, and uh, to be frank, I think Cyclops 
as well, even characters who were created by other creators. I think uh, those characters are who they are because of your work. And, uh, Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, Patrick, uh, want to ask, how did the idea for the film come to be? Um, well, so Chris's work was kind of what got me into comics in the first place. I had read um, his work when I was younger. I read, eventually read the whole uh, X-Men run. And I was just kind of blown away by uh, just how much of, you know, things that have become part of our cultural mythology, like, you know, Dark Phoenix or characters like Wolverine and Storm uh, came out of his work and the work he did with the editors and artists. And it was something where you could witness sort of, you know, cultural mythology being created on an issue-by-issue basis when you read it. And I think that people don't fully appreciate that. And I don't think they understand, you know, that these characters don't just come out of the ether. They don't just, you know, pop out of nowhere, they were created by specific choices that, you know, the artists and Chris and everybody made. And I think it, it's interesting to, you know, get the people together who helped determine these things and let them tell their stories and, you know, bring them to the screen and kind of create, uh, you know, a movie that captures that and that serves as a record for the future. So I think hearing, you know, Chris and uh, Louise and Jim Shooter all sort of telling their own take on Dark Phoenix and how it came to be that Gene would die at the end of the Dark Phoenix story is fascinating because this was not something that was, you know, uh, sort of decided on high. It was all kinds of tempers flaring and decisions being made and sort of uh, emotions running hot. And then it led to this story that is now, you know, we're going to see on the screen. We saw on the screen before. We saw in cartoons. We're going to see it on screen again. But it was created by these people. So I, th- I think you know, taking it off of the shelf of mythology and bringing it down to something that people created was really interesting to me. Um, and as, you know, a huge fan of the work myself, it was just a really cool to get to talk to everybody who was involved in creating the stuff. And in in the vein of that question, uh, what, in your opinion, Patrick, has made uh, Chris's tenure on X-Men endure? I mean, it certainly was unique in many facets, it, it, I think, uh, is the longest single tenure, or it may be tied for the longest single tenure, uh, for an American comic writer on a single comic. But beyond that, what is it that has defined Chris's run, other than longevity? I mean, for, for me as a, a reader, I think that it was just seeing the characters change, and that's something that you know, at the time, there weren't shows like Sopranos or, or Buffy or whatever where the, the characters changed over the years. It was something that wasn't being done, but when you read it now, it's just so subtle that you can't, you know, you never have a moment where you're like, oh, Storm went crazy. You know, she's going to put a mohawk on now. She's totally, like, changed from this character that she was, but when you look from, you know, point A to point B, there's this incredible difference, but it, it went there subtly. And I think the same is true with, you know, Wolverine or, or Kitty or any of the characters that have a one run. And I think that's something that you can't get really outside of, you know, episodic TV or comics where there's this component of time and it's just watching stuff change and even the style of the medium change and the style of art change. And it all happens subtly, but you get to see it evolve. And I think that's so cool. I mean, it's, I wish that it, the, books were like in print in a way that's easier for people to read because you want to read it all. You want to read the whole thing. Go back to your comic book store and buy all the back issues. <laughs> that's the best way to do it. Or, or I mean, to, I, to be frank, to... Uh, the only trouble with oh, that is I, my basement flooded uh, two weeks ago and just lost all my back issues. So oh. that's that's a dangerous situation. Oh, how unfortunate. Oh. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> very, very sorry to hear that. That that, that unfortunately happened to a very uh, prominent Stephen King uh, memorabilia holder too, just in the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. I was about to say that the yeah. next solution was to have been around in 1976 and 1977 and just been along for the ride, which was my great fortune uh, through the entire 17-year period. Um, with a quick personal aside, as we wrap up here. Uh, the day they let you off the book, Chris, was the day I stopped reading the X-Men. I started with 102, and I ended with, uh, what was it, X-Men 3 or 4, whichever was your last issue. I was there for 90, 90% of your run, 
And again, it is unparalleled in the comic industry. Uh, the industry owes you a great debt. We, the fans, truly appreciate your work. Well, that's that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> Very true, and one unfortunately, uh, uh, we won't have time to do today. But we do want to remind uh, our listeners that the uh, the film Chris Claremont's X Men will be out uh, viewer on demand February sixth from Accelerator. Please check it out. Wonderful uh, view. If you're an old timer like me, it's it's a wonderful walk down memory lane. If you're a newer fan, if you're a millennial, wonderful essential history of comic books in this film. Uh, Want to thank uh, Patrick and Chris for their time today. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate thank it. You. And uh, continued success. This is uh, Jason Malcolm Stewart for Active Voices and Age of the Nerd. Thanks so much for tuning in to this very, very special episode of Active Voices, and we'll catch you on the flip side. Hey, Dr. Nerd, video.